Okay, so page uh, 14. Um, we started um, a little bit of notes from um, vertical asymptotes, right? One side of limit. Um, do we do number four? We did the number four, right? OK, um, let's talk about number five here. And I just want to kind of point out just something a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, just some adjustment required in terms of how we represent this limit. So uh, let's walk through number five together. OK, so first things first, let's go ahead and do. Um, uh, the right substitution, right? So replace one in for all the X's. OK, so what does that tell us just from that? OK, we know this vertical asymptote at X equals negative one, which means that we already know the limit doesn't exist. OK, so and we don't see any one side limit here, so let's just say D and E. Okay. Right. That is, I would say for the most part is acceptable, but we can actually go a little further into this because Something I haven't talked to you about is this here. Let me go back to my diagram here. Now, the limit doesn't exist for all these four options, right? So we're in agreement there, right? This li the full limit doesn't exist here because these are all asymptotes. However, under the subcategory of does not exist, sometimes we're able to provide a bit more, um, uh, a bit more information about that limit. So technically, if we see a situation like this, we can say that the limit doesn't exist, but we can also say that the limit is equal to infinity, which is a more um, detailed description as to why the limit doesn't exist. Right? And then in this case, we can say the limit is equal to what? Negative infinity, but just understand that it is a subcategory, a more detailed subcategory of does not exist. However, if the arrows are not pointing the same direction, then the most we can say is does not exist. So for a problem like this, um, if it was like a multiple choice question on the AP exam, uh, if it was between does not exist and positive or negative infinity, um, we may have to dig a little deeper and, and, and see how the graph is behaving on either side to see if we can give it a bit more detail beyond does not exist. Does that make sense? OK, so let's go ahead and just find each of the one side of limits and see if uh, we're able to gather more information. Now I'm going to go ahead and factor this. This is really X minus one squared, right? So we know both of these. We can test decimals because we know that we're headed towards a, uh, an asymptote there. So here I'm going to test um, x equals what's a value I can test for? Yeah, 0 0.9. So I'm going to just insert 0 0.9 in for x, 0 0.9 minus 3. I don't care about the decimal value. I just want to know whether it's positive or negative. And 0 0.9 minus 1 squared. Well, the nice thing is that that squared is always going to force everything to be positive. So negative over a positive is negative, so negative infinity. So we know the one side limit coming from the left side is negative infinity. From the right side, what decimal can I choose? 
right? 1.1 minus 3 is negative. 1.1 minus 1 squared. Again, anything squared is positive, so. So it does not exist is correct, but a, but a, a, a more detailed answer and a potential uh, replacement for does not exist could be negative infinity. So I would say if it was a free response question, I would accept either one, but if it was multiple choice and this was not available and you would have to choose negative infinity. Any questions? OK, I think uh, one through six below, um, I think are pretty straightforward. It's just asking for vertical asymptotes. So all we need to do is factor everything and see if there's any remaining factors in the denominator that does not go away. And if it doesn't go away, then that's a vertical asymptote. So I think that's pretty easy. Nothing new for me to go over there. So let's skip that section and let's go to page 15. So we have two subcategories here that uh, we've been going through here. One is infinite limits. So infinite limits is um, where my arrow is headed up to positive infinity as it approaches a vertical asymptote. And then we also have limits at infinity, and that's end behavior. That means as the arrow is exiting from view of our coordinate plane, where is that arrow headed? Is it flattening out towards a, a a specific y value or is it going up or down to negative infinity so um so infinite limits versus limits at infinity um one's referring to vertical asymptotes the other's referring to potential horizontal asymptotes so limits at infinity so what is a y value approach as the x value approaches negative infinity and positive infinity um, does it approach a specific number or is it growing without bound? That is the uh, question we're trying to answer um, when we are looking at end behavior to see, you know, is the arrow kind of flattening out or is it moving um, without bound towards positive or negative infinity? So the way we check for horizontal asymptotes is we find the limit as x approaches infinity or the limit as x approaches negative infinity. Sometimes, a lot of times, these are going to be. If there's a horizontal asymptote, a lot of times these will be the same, but sometimes these may be different. Okay. So here is um, the big change here. If we're doing limit as x approaches infinity, we don't do the same process as before. Before, I said always do direct substitution, right? We do direct substitution if we are approaching a real number, but if we're approaching infinity or negative infinity, we have a different set of steps. We go ahead and we compare degrees between numerator and denominator. So we have to switch gears a bit, different set of rules, different set of steps if we're approaching either positive or negative infinity. Okay. So when we compare degrees, we're looking at the highest degree in the numerator and the highest degree in the denominator. That's all we care about. Okay. So let me go through a couple of, um, of a rule scheme. So if my numerator degree is less than my denominator degree, so here, degree two versus degree three, my denominator degree is higher, then my horizontal asymptote is equal to zero, or my limit as x approaches infinity is equal to zero. So you can memorize this, but you can also make sense of this. Okay, so let me kind of talk about how you'll be able to figure this out just by looking, just by kind of thinking about what's happening with this expression. Now, we understand that the coefficient has little to no impact on the variable, right? So we look at the, the variable of the highest degree to see which one is growing faster, right? So which side is growing faster, obviously here, denominator. So if my denominator is growing faster than my numerator, then what's happening is that my fraction is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller, and that's why it's headed towards zero. Right. So even if the numerator starts off um, having a higher, higher value, eventually this x cubed is going to overtake any 
advantage that this x squared had with the coefficient and the um, and the constant, and it's going to eventually win out. And eventually that gap is going to become so huge where that denominator is going to force this fraction to become closer and closer towards zero. All right. All right. Second, if my denominator degree is equal to my numerator degree, then eventually they are kind of leveling out and kind of moving along the same rate. And really the only difference is that um, we can figure out where that line is going to be by taking the leading coefficients. Okay. So because they're growing at the same rate, they're going to be kind of leveling off and uh, flattening out towards a certain value. And that value is always going to be the leading coefficients of your highest degree. So in this case, my limit is five halves. And because my limit is five halves and, and zero, that means these are also referring to horizontal asymptotes. That means you can draw a dotted line at zero and five halves for there for these respective functions, and the graphs will will flatten out um, on both sides out of infinity. The only time that the x approaches matters is for the third condition, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So, yeah, I just thought of some something here um, for the second example. Okay limit as x approaches negative infinity also follows the same rule. So we simply look at the degree and we just take the coefficient. OK, so I don't want us to be thrown off by the negative infinity and think, oh, I got to make an adjustment and I got to change the sign. I see some students, they see negative infinity, they feel like they got to do something different with it. So they put a negative five halves. OK, so um, it's going to be the same coefficient Sorry, same asymptote on either side of infinity. So just take the ratio. Don't try to do anything with the sign change. Okay? It's not, there's no sign change. Okay, so it's gonna be the same, just the ratio to, regardless of positive or negative infinity. Now, um, we may, um, like I said, we may need to um, do some adjustment if my numerator has a higher degree. Okay, so here, my numerator has a higher degree than my denominator. So regardless of any advantage that the denominator may have from other terms, eventually that x cubed is going to win out over that x squared. So what's going to happen to this value over time as x approaches infinity? The numerator is going to yeah, it's going to grow at a faster rate than the denominator, which means that this value is going to grow without bound. But it's two options, right? Maybe it's it's growing without bound in the positive direction, or it's growing without bound in the negative direction. But we know it's either positive or negative infinity. Right. So I want to help make sense of these three without, you know, if you uh, if for some reason you forget um, the the memorization of these, we should be able to just still reason it out and make sense of it um, uh, from just logically thinking about what's happening to that fraction. So we have only two options here, either positive or negative infinity. And a quick way for us to decide how the graph is moving um, as it approaches positive or negative infinity uh, is to test some numbers here. So the way that we're going to test this is look at where it's headed, right? It's headed towards infinity. So I think an easy number for us to test is 100. And that should give us a pretty good feel as to how the arrow is moving as it goes in that direction. And we don't really care about numerically what the value is. We just want to know whether it's positive or negative. So don't go about trying to trying to find out what the value is. It's not worth the time. Just plug in the 100 in for X and just convince yourself, OK, is that value positive or negative? So if I put 100 into the numerator, I get a positive value. If I put 100 into the denominator, I'm also going to get a positive value. So I know that um, this graph is not going to have a horizontal asymptote. And as it exits, the graph, whatever the graph looks like, it's going to eventually head up towards positive infinity. Likewise, if my graph, if my limit is approaching negative infinity and I still have this higher degree in the numerator, then I just insert negative 100 to quickly test to see if I can convince whether my sign is positive or negative. Um, OK, so do you guys want to try four through nine? They should go pretty quickly. 
Um, again, if you're approaching infinity or negative infinity, there's no direct substitution. You're just directly going into comparing degrees. OK, so try four through nine, and then we'll walk through um, the solutions. Okay, so number four, my numerator is greater than my denominator. I know that the limit is not going to exist. It's either going to fly up towards positive infinity or negative infinity, but I don't know which direction it's headed. So I'm going to choose a value in the direction that the graph is headed. It's headed towards positive infinity. I'll test 100. I'll insert 100 into my numerator and denominator and convince myself that my numerator and denominator are both positive. So I know my um, um, graph is headed uh, up towards positive infinity. Uh, number five, same expression. We're going, however, in the negative infinity direction. So I'll choose negative 100 to test. In this case, my numerator is positive, my denominator is negative. So I know as I follow the arrow to the left, it's going to point downwards towards negative infinity. For number six, my degrees are the same. And so I just take the ratio of the coefficients, negative three halves. Sometimes the uh, tricky thing with these problems is um, that your um, terms are not written in standard form. So sometimes you may have to go seeking out the highest degree, and sometimes it could be hiding you know, in the middle of the expression. So just make sure that you're reading the entire expression and actually finding the highest exponents before you commit to the relationship. Um, for number seven, again, the degree is the same, so negative three halves. Notice that these did not change, right? Whether it's positive or negative infinity, as long as my degrees are the same, I just take the ratio of the coefficients. I'm not going to make a different adjustment for negative infinity. It's going to be the same asymptote on either side of the graph. For number eight, my degree in the denominator is higher. That's the easiest one. You know, it's always going to be zero. There's not going to be any. Um, variations to that. And then number nine, my degree is higher than numerator. I'm headed towards negative infinity. So test negative 100 to choose between negative or positive infinity. Okay, questions? All right, next page. It's not. It's the same. Yeah. If it's X, it's X approaching. That's right. Right. So when we say end behavior, um, we can simply think in terms of limit as X approaches infinity or negative.
Everybody good with this page? All right, next. All right, so there are some exceptions to at the horizontal asymptotes. Usually we said that, you know, if we're dealing with a, uh, a like a normal rational function, um, typically there's only one horizontal asymptote. Um, there's not going to be a sudden change. However, if there is a radical involved in the numerator or denominator, we may have a graph that looks like this. OK, so um, just have to be aware that. Depending on which direction you're headed, you may have a different asymptote. Okay, so let's talk about um, um, how to uh, think about these problems here. So let's again start off with um, looking at this function and asking ourselves, OK, if I want to find horizontal asymptotes, I know I'm going to be comparing degrees. What do you notice about the degrees between the numerator and denominator here? Right. Essentially, my numerator degree is degree one. What's the degree of my denominator? It's still a one, right? If I take the, if I think about that x squared, and you know, I take the square root of x squared, that's going to bring me back down to x. So the idea here is that it, there's an x squared showing here, but it's under a square root umbrella. So we know that these are really the same degrees. Okay, so if they're the same degrees, we know that um, they're growing at the same rate, uh, essentially. There is going to be a horizontal asymptote, OK, but it's just depending on where it is. OK, so first off, let's establish the fact that the degrees are the same between the numerator and denominator. However, there is a radical in the denominator, so um, that gives us a red flag to know that, OK, I need to test both these instances because it's not like a normal horizontal asymptote where there's only one continuous one that stretches from one side to the other. There's different horizontal asymptotes depending on which uh, direction we're headed. So let's look at one at a time. So the easier one is approaching pause infinity. This one. Uh, we simply look at the degrees. The degrees are the same, so we're simply going to take the ratio of the coefficient. What's the coefficient of my numerator? Three. What's the coefficient of my denominator? Two. Good. Two. Because if I were to clean this up, root four is really a two, right? And then root x squared is really an x, so really it's a two x that's sitting here. So three over two. Okay. It says find the horizontal asymptotes. So there's one horizontal asymptote at y equals three halves. It doesn't apply for the left side. It only applies for the right side. And here's a visual as to what ha what's happening here. This is what the graph looks like. So we're trying to determine this without the use of a graph. Everybody good so far? So now let's look at the limit headed towards the other direction. Again, it's headed towards infinity or negative infinity. In this case, negative infinity. We are still going to take the ratio of the coefficients. So it's still going to be 3 over square root of 4, 3 over 2. But let's imagine what's happening here, right? So if I were to insert, let's say, a negative 100 into my expression, my numerator is going to become what? Negative. Now, my denominator, if I insert negative 100 in for x squared, that's going to turn into a positive and the square root of a positive is still a positive. So negative over a positive is going to be a negative. So I'm going to get a negative three halves here. But the big picture here is that your split asymptote will have the same ratio. It's just the signs will be different. That's all. Any questions there? So this is a, a special case when we have to worry about two different asymptotes. It's a kind of a strange shape graph here. 
OK, next up, uh, comparative growth rates. So sometimes we're able to decide how the graph is behaving in certain situations. OK, so this only works for um, uh, for very specific situations, but sometimes it can save time and allows us to um, to get to our um, limit without having to go through a bunch of extra steps. So um, it's nice to um, to understand uh, this section here compared to growth rates. So this is what we can do. We have families of functions that grow at predictable rates in relation to each other. OK, so if I have a exponential versus a log or a polynomial versus a natural log, it does need to be a one to one. It does need to be a numerator or over a denominator. But in those cases, uh, we're able to quickly um, make a conclusion as to how the graph is behaving. So a lot of restrictions here, but even with that, it still can be useful in um, in in a good number of situations. So families of functions grow at pre predictable rates in relation to each other, but this relationship only works if we're approaching infinity. Okay, this doesn't work if we're approaching negative infinity. We got to do something else if it's negative infinity. So only works for infinity. So here is the relationship: logs grow at the slowest rate. So we're just looking at the graph as we move to the right. So natural log here, it, it, it's growing towards positive infinity, but it's in relation to others, it's, it's growing at a slowest rate. Radicals is next up. It's a little bit faster than logs, but it's still you know, kind of inching upwards slowly. Polynomial or algebraic by x squared is going to grow at a faster rate than the other two. And then exponential e to the x, 2 to the x. If I have my variable in the exponent, that is going to grow at the fastest rate. So here is something that um, we can do. OK, let's say I have the limit xx approach infinity, and let's say I have a numerator and denominator that only has one type of function above each other. So here's the general rule here. If I have the slower function above and the faster function below, guess what my limit is always going to be? Zero. Zero. Yep. So if my denominator is growing at a faster rate, then my fraction is getting smaller and smaller towards zero. Okay. And the other here, other scenario is, um, sorry, only works for positive infinity. If my faster is up top and my slower is below, then what's going to happen? Unbounded. Unbounded, right? So one of two options. It's either this or this. And very similar to um, limit x approach infinity. If my degree is higher than my denominator, I'm going to test x equals 100 just to help me decide between those two. But the exception is that this doesn't work for negative infinity. Okay, this only this relationship is only going to be true if we're headed to the right. Okay, and this only works if my numerator and denominator are cleanly one type of function versus the other. So if my numerator is logs plus polynomial, my denominator is radical plus exponential, uh, you know, we're going to that's, that's not as easy for us to decipher. OK, um, but if if the numerator is only one type and the denominator is a different type, then we can make a quick um, um, a quick conclusion as to what's happening. OK, so let's look at example 11 here again. It's got it's only works if we're approaching infinity. My numerator, OK, what family of function does that fall under? It's a radical, right? So radical function. And my denominator is polynomial, algebraic. I know there's only one term here, but it does fall under that um, polynomial family here. OK, so which side is growing at a faster rate? Polynomial. Yep, the polynomial, which is in the denominator, which means my limit is going to be what? Zero. So we're able to get a quick read, even though it looks complicated. We know which side is growing faster, and it's either infinity or zero. Okay. You guys want to try these uh, next ones here and 
see if this um, see if we can see if these uh, steps make sense, and then we'll compare our answers. If my numerator is growing at a faster rate than my denominator, then I will have to test x equals 100. Okay, because even if it's infinity, we we still having to choose between two options. Okay, let's check our answers here. All right, any questions here? All right, let's do miscellaneous review on the last page here of our notes. All right, try number five. If the function f is continuous for all real numbers, and if f of x is equal to my function when x doesn't equal to negative two, then f of negative two is equal to. Well, my I know my function is continuous, so I like to just go through continuity conditions because I don't have to worry about uh, doing anything different than that. So if I just can go through my continuity conditions, then my answer will just show up. Um, but you don't have to show all the steps for continuity conditions if it doesn't ask you to. But um, I think that's just provides a nice structure. You don't have to worry about you know, doing something different for um, for different problems. You can just follow the steps. Okay, so.
Mm -hmm. So if it didn't say if I have, so I say if it's continuous or not at a point, do I have to do it for every single condition? Um, if it's asking you to justify, then you would have to go through continuity conditions. Okay. Um, but so these, ones. these ones you don't have to, okay. um, but I'm just encouraging students to do it because it just feels like such an easy thing to, um, to follow. Yeah. yeah. OK, uh, let's spend the next few minutes here. See if we can see how far we can get between 7 and 13. Uh, go ahead and skip number 9. Um, I didn't go over those rules because I, I, I wanted to just uh, have a different process for that down the road. So go ahead and skip number 9 here. So, so for the next five minutes or so, see how far we can get. Are we good? Seven and eight. Any questions with seven and eight? That is good. Let me show the rest of this page here. Thirteen. We have to worry about split asymptotes because the degrees are the same, but one side is showing a radical. So for number 11, I know that the limit doesn't exist. 
because it's not a one side of limit and I'm getting a zero in the denominator with a non zero up top. But I am testing one side of limits because I want to see can I. Can I uh, provide more information? Can I say it's either positive or negative infinity? But to do that, I need to make sure that the one side limits are in agreement. But one is headed towards negative infinity, the other is headed up. They're not consistent, so we can't uh, categorize it any further. The, the most we can say is does not exist for no relay. OK, so uh, you guys have homework over 1.5. And then on Monday, we'll uh, do test review. I have a test review worksheet for you. We'll work through that. Tuesday, we'll do review day. Wednesday, we'll start our next unit. Not on the test yet, but then gives you an extra day to study. And then Thursday is your test on over uh, unit one. Limits. All right, let's go get the phone.